Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the intersection of philosophical naturalism with paleoconservatism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. For today's episode, we will be looking at Suicide, a Study in Sociology by Emil Durkheim. This was uh, translated by John A. Spaulding and George Simpson. It was originally written in French in 1897. And uh, Durkheim is considered one of, if not the father of sociology and the uh, uh, application of the scientific method to sociological phenomena. And this book uh, is sort of his main example of zeroing in on a particular phenomena, in this case suicide, and and looking at it from a sort of an impartial, uh, clear-headed approach, examining the data uh, in aggregate and trying to draw some conclusions about suicide and what causes it. Uh, it's a really interesting book. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of da data in here, a lot of tables, and he really examines the numbers of suicides at different times among different groups of people. Um, it's, it's interesting that this data was even collected at that time, considering that it hadn't really been gone through specifically in this manner up until he wrote this book. Uh, but he has a fair amount of data that he can draw from, from countries in Europe throughout the 19th century, and the numbers of suicides and the sorts of people who committed suicides, what age they were, uh, etc. And so he draws some really interesting conclusions uh, in this book. So I'm going to go over only a few sections of it. This isn't a podcast, obviously, about suicide. Um it's a podcast more about sociological phenomena and conservatism and, uh, and things of that nature. So there's a, there are a number of parts in here that I'm not really going to concern myself with quite so much as some of, his, some of his initial conclusions that he draws about what is driving suicide uh, at that time and place in history. I do feel that I should mention that I am by no means an expert in the topic of suicide. And like I said, this episode isn't really going to focus all that closely on suicide as such. So uh, if you're listening to this episode hoping for some real deep insight about suicide, perhaps the suicide of a loved one, or even if you're feeling suicidal yourself and you want to explore why you're feeling that way, I'm not going to say that there's nothing useful in this episode for you, but uh, that's not my area of expertise in any way, shape, or form. So um, I just want to say if you're feeling suicidal, you should always make sure that you reach out to someone that you care about and that cares about you and talk to them about how you're feeling. And uh, if that isn't an option for you, then to reach out to a professional uh, who, who has studied the different causes of suicidal thoughts and suicidal tendencies in people um, much more thoroughly than I ever have. So, uh, but I, you know, and, and reach out to somebody if you want to reach out to me, you're more than welcome to. Again, I'm not a professional, but I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, so you can do so at uh, natureinthenation at gmail.com. Um, but with that said, I am going to be digging in a little bit to find out some of Durkheim's insight into why it is that suicide uh, happens and what causes suicide rates to rise or fall. And, and that's really what he com how he comes at it. He looks at it not on the individual case, to go to an individual person and look at their life and their circumstances and try to find what it is that has caused this person or that person to commit suicide. He looks instead at so sociological phenomena as a whole. So he says, in France, in the year 1870, 
How many people committed suicide? In Germany in 1870, how many people committed suicide? And then in 1871, how many people in France and Germany committed suicide? What were their demographic qualities? What were their religions, their ages, their marital status? And can we determine any trends from this? And I think that's a really interesting and important way to approach it because if you see, as he does, if you see some societies or groups within societies that have suicide rates at much higher levels than others, and this sort of like, like say a, a one, one group of people will have a suicide rate at three times that of another in, say, 1870. And then in the next year, in 1871, the same group of people will have three times the suicide rate as the other group of people from one year to the next. Well, that seems a sort of consistency that carries on over time. Those obviously aren't the same people committing suicide multiple times, obviously. So there's some other factor that's causing this, this consistent disparity. And so to go into individual people's lives and, well, it's this or it's that or the other thing, that sometimes might miss something that, that you could pick up when you look at the greater trends. And that's what he does, and I think that's kind of the innovative part of what he's doing. Remember, this is written in 1897, so um, some of the things that we would say, oh, that's just the natural uh, way that you would look at this sort of thing, wasn't always, it wasn't always looked at in that way. He was a, really a pioneer in that regard. Now, I'm going, going to read three sections out of this book, and they're all fairly close together um, in, the, in the, you know, the, the length of the book. And the first one is sort of long, the second one is quite short, and then the third one is the longest of all. And uh, he's talking about, in these sections, he's talking about what he calls egoistic suicide. So he breaks suicide down into three different types of suicides. Egoistic suicide, uh, altruistic suicide, and anomic suicide. And after I read this, I'll, uh, I will get a little more into detail about what those three different types of suicides are, uh, and how I feel those apply to our modern world. And I am going to be looking at how, you know, some of the ideas that he presents, how those things apply to our modern world. Uh, but to start off with, the first section that I want to read is when he, be when he starts to look at the uh, religious demographics of people who commit suicide. And he's, it's actually, you know, it's not at the very beginning of the section, but it's fairly close to the beginning. He's, he lays out some, some data about the suicide rates of different countries and different regions of countries, uh, like different regions of Germany and, uh, I mean, I think different, the different districts in France. And he looks at the different, uh, religious makeup of these different districts and he looks at the religions of the individual people. Now, this isn't the beginning of the book. Actually, there's a fairly long section before that when he he kind of dismisses all of the various ideas that are commonly given for reasons for suicide, like insanity, like economic factors, um, dis, you know, unhappiness, things like that. Things that an individual person, you might say, this person has committed their suicide because they went broke or they went, they committed their suicide because of this or that or the other thing. And he basically dis, dismantles those and says, if you look at the data, a lot of these, um, a lot of these causes don't really stand up. So then when he begins to, he begins in the chapter on egoistic suicide, he begins to zero in on what data actually does support. And the first thing he looks at is religion. So I want to read a section here uh, when he begins to talk about uh, Catholicism and Protestantism and the difference between them. He says, quote, Whatever the proportional share of these two confessions in the total population, wherever their comparison has been possible from the point of view of suicide, Protestants are found to kill themselves much more often than Catholics. There are even countries like the Upper Palatinate and Upper Bavaria, where the population is almost wholly Catholic, 92 and 96 percent, and where there are nevertheless 300 and 423 Protestant suicides to 100 Catholic suicides. <laughs> 
the proportion even rises to 528% in Lower Bavaria, where the Reformed religion has not quite one follower to 100 inhabitants. Therefore, even if the prudence incumbent on minorities were a partial cause of the great difference between the two religions, the greatest share is certainly due to other causes. We shall find these other causes in the nature of these two religious systems. Yet, they both prohibit suicide with equal emphasis. Not only do they penalize it morally with great severity, but both teach that a new life begins beyond the tomb when men are punished for their evil actions, and Protestantism, just as well as Catholicism, numbers suicide among them. Finally, in both cults, these prohibitions are of divine origin. They are represented not as the logical conclusion of correct reason, but God himself is their authority. Therefore, if Protestantism is less unfavorable to the development of suicide, it is not because of a different attitude from that of the Catholicism. Thus, if both religions have the same precepts with respect to this particular matter, their dissimilar influence on suicide must proceed from one of the more general characteristics differentiating them. The only essential difference between Catholicism and Protestantism is that the second permits free inquiry to a far greater degree than the first. Of course, Catholicism, by the very fact that it is an idealistic religion, concedes a far greater place to thought and reflection than Greco-Latin polytheism or Hebrew monotheism. It is not restricted to mechanical ceremonies, but seeks the control of the conscience. So it appeals to conscience, and even when demanding blind submission of reason does so by employing the language of reason. Nonetheless, the Catholic accepts his faith ready-made, without scrutiny. He may not even submit it to historical examination. A whole hierarchical system of authority is devised, with marvelous ingenuity, to render tradition invariable. All variation is abhorrent to Catholic thought. The Protestant is far more the author of his faith. The Bible is put in his hands, and no interpretation is imposed upon him. The very structure of the Reformed cult stresses this state of religious individualism. Nowhere but in England is the Protestant clergy a hierarchy. Like the worshippers, the priest has no other source but himself and his conscience. He is a more instructed guide than the run of worshippers, but with no special authority for fixing dogma. But what best proves that this freedom of inquiry proclaimed by the founders of the Reformation has not remained a platonic affirmation is the increasing multiplicity of all sorts of sects, so strikingly in contrast with the indivisible unity of the Catholic Church. We thus reach our first conclusion that the proclivity of Protestantism for suicide must relate to the spirit of free inquiry that animates this religion. Let us understand this relationship correctly. Free inquiry itself is only the effect of another cause. When it appears, when men, after having long received their ready-made faith from tradition, claim the right to shape it for themselves, this is not because of the intrinsic desirability of free inquiry, for the latter involves as much sorrow as happiness. But it is because men henceforth need this liberty. This very need can have only one cause, the overthrow of traditional beliefs. If they still asserted themselves with equal energy, it would never occur to men to criticize them. If they still had the same authority, men would not demand the right to verify the source of this authority. Reflection develops only if its development becomes imperative, that is, if certain ideas and instinctive sentiments which have hitherto adequately guided conduct are found to have lost their efficacy. Then reflection intervenes to fill the gap that has appeared, but which it has not created. Just as reflection disappears to the extent that thought and action take the form of automatic habits, it awakes only when accepted habits become disorganized. It asserts its rights against public opinion only when the latter loses strength, 
that is, when it is no longer prevalent to the same extent. If these assertions occur not merely occasionally and as passing crises, but become chronic, if individual consciences keep reaffirming their autonomy, it is because they are constantly subject to conflicting impulses, because a new opinion has not been formed to replace the old one no longer existing. If a new system of beliefs were constituted which seemed as indisputable to everyone as the old, no one would think of discussing it any longer. Its discussion would no longer even be permitted, for ideas shared by an entire society draw from this consensus an authority that makes them sacrosanct and raises them above dispute. For them to have become more tolerant, they must first already have become the object of less general and complete assent and been weakened by preliminary controversy. Thus, if it is correct to say that free inquiry once proclaimed multiplies schisms, it must be added that it presupposes them and derives from them, for it is claimed and instituted as a principle only in order to permit latent or half-declared schisms to develop more freely. So if Protestantism concedes a greater freedom to individual thought than Catholicism, it is because it has fewer common beliefs and practices. Now, a religious society cannot exist without a collective credo, and the more extensive the credo, the more unified and strong is the society. For it does not unite men by an exchange and reciprocity of services, a temporal bond of union which permits and even presupposes differences, but which a religious society cannot form. It socializes men only by attaching them completely to an identical body of doctrine and socializes them in proportion as this body of doctrine is extensive and firm. The more numerous the manners of action and thought of a religious character are, which are accordingly removed from free inquiry, the more the idea of God presents itself in all details of existence and makes individual wills converge to one identical goal. Inversely, the greater concessions a confessional group makes to individual judgment, the less it dominates lives, the less its cohesion and vitality. We thus reach the conclusion that the superiority of Protestantism with respect to suicide results from its being a less strongly integrated church than the Catholic Church. This also explains the situation of Judaism. Indeed, the reproach to which the Jews have for so long been exposed by Christianity has created feelings of unusual solidarity among them. Their need of resisting a general hostility the very impossibility of free communication with the rest of the population has forced them to strict union among themselves. Consequently, each community became a small, compact, and coherent society with a strong feeling of self-consciousness and unity. Everyone thought and lived alike. Individual divergences were made almost impossible by the community of existence and the close and constant surveillance of all over each. The Jewish church has thus been more strongly united than any other from its dependence on itself because of being the object of intolerance. By analogy with what has just been observed a propos of Protestantism, the same cause must therefore be assumed for the slight tendency of the Jews to suicide in spite of all sorts of circumstances which might, on the contrary, incline them to it. Doubtless, they owe this immunity, in a sense, to the hostility surrounding them. But if this is its influence, it is not because it imposes a higher morality, but because it obliges them to live in greater union. They are immune to this degree because their religious society is of such solidarity. Besides, the ostracism to which they are subject is only one of the causes producing this result. The very nature of Jewish beliefs must contribute largely to it. Judaism, in fact, like all early religions, consists basically of a body of practices, minutely governing all the details of life and leaving little room to individual judgment. End quote. Okay, so basically he's saying that the, that the, Pro the Protestant has a much higher rate of suicide. You're talking three, four, five times as, as frequently do Protestants commit suicide versus Catholics. And this occurs even in 
places where there are some Protestants and some Catholics. Uh, it's It occurs in predominantly Catholic places. It occurs in predominantly Protestant places. It's this sort of universal tendency of the Protestant towards suicide that the Catholic doesn't have. And he essentially says this is because the Protestant allows for so much free uh, inquiry, but the free inquiry itself, he says, is not actually the cause, but it itself is a is another uh, symptom of the fact that the, there's no hard, fast doctrine to which people feel uh, inherently bound. There's no hierarchy in the churches, or at least there's not a hierarchy to the extent that the Catholic Church is a very strict hierarchy. It doesn't control people's lives in such uh, thorough, specific ways, and so there's not the same degree of unity because everybody's uh, thoughts are not uh, in agreement. There's there's conflict and there's dispute, and he, he points out how the Protestantism actually has all these different sects, all these different uh, forms of Protestantism, from the Baptists to the Lutherans, the Calvinists, etc., etc., who all kind of approach it on their in their own terms and find their own method of interpreting uh, Scripture, whereas the Catholic is very much... You know, the it's it's a unified church. The sort of deviation is not permitted, um, and on account of that, he 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 says that's a that's a core reason why the suicide rates are lower. Now, how does how does that correspond? How does that hierarchy and those strict social norms and that sense of solidarity and unity uh, that is derived from the uh, the complete control over people's lives by religion, uh, how does that translate into suicide? Well, well, we'll get a little bit into that in a little bit more detail. Um, but I think there's one thing that I want to just point out here is that he says that the, the Protestant and the Catholic both condemn suicide. So the radically different rates in suicide can't be attributed to some different point of doctrine. The, the difference comes from the nature of the church, the nature of the belief, how people approach their religion, and not so much the content of the doctrine. Uh, I think this is important. Like, we looked at uh, myths to live by and the different roles that mythology plays, and one of those roles was explaining the world uh, and the other roles that mythology and, and thus religion played we're not necessarily explaining the role, the explaining the nature of of reality, but serving sort of a communal bond between people and guiding them and providing them with a sense of meaning, et cetera, et cetera. And so, I think that what he's kind of driving at, and he drives at it more at different points in the book, is that is that the doctrine itself is not really what is serving these other roles that religion plays in in societies it's not about the set of beliefs it's about how the church is structured and how involved it is in people's lives and how um unified the people are who who adhere to it how much it allows for people to uh, question the beliefs um and there's this the 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 more the church is open to reinterpretation, the more people feel like they're not as closely connected to their community, to their neighbors. When everybody's got their own interpretation, then there, there's just so, sort of the social strife that occurs, the social dislocation, uh, and the community as a whole is not strengthened as much. Um, so I'm going to jump into the next section here. I'm actually, I think I'm going to read all three of these sections before I really get into the deeper analysis. And so the second section, he talks a little bit about families and he talks, you know, this is, he's talk he talks about families a little bit prior to the section I'm quoting, 
and he basically says, you know, he 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 comes up with a whole lot of statistics about married people versus unmarried people, married men versus unmarried men, uh, unmarried women, uh, widows versus widowers, people with children, without children, widowers with children, widower uh, widows without children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and at some points it starts getting a little confusing, but I think this is a short section here that I want to read that kind of caps off the, the point of the whole thing a little bit. And so it's not very long, but he says, quote, suicide has constantly increased since 1826 and the birth rate has decreased from 1821 to 1830. The latter was still 308 births for every 10,000 inhabitants. During the period 1881 to 88, it was only 240. And the decrease was uninterrupted in the interval. At the same time, there appears a tendency for the family to break up and disperse more and more. From 1856 to 1886, the number of households increased by 2 million in round figures. Regularly and steadily, it rose from 8.8 million to 10.7 million. Yet during the same time interval, the population increased only by 2 million persons. Each family, therefore, includes a smaller membership. End quote. So I just want to jump in here real quick and, and say he's talking specifically about France, uh, not about the U.S. or about Europe or anything else. He's this, when, when, he, when he doesn't specify what nation he's talking about, then in that instance he's talking about france um and so yeah he's basically saying that the population has increased by two million people approximately two million people the number of households has also increased by approximately two million people but um that would mean an increase of two million households with the size of one person per household which is clearly smaller than the average uh, household so it, that inevitably leads to a, a smaller size of the average household that's driving this this uh this spread of households so fewer children um more people single more people unmarried etc cetera, etc cetera. and so to go back in here he says quote facts thus are far from confirming the current idea that suicide is due especially to life's burdens since on the contrary it diminishes as these burdens increase there is a consequence of Malthusianism not foreseen by its author. When he urged control of the numbers in families, he felt that this restriction was, at least in some cases, necessary to general well-being. Actually, it is so much a source of the reverse condition that it diminishes the human desire to live. Far from dense families being a sort of unnecessary luxury appropriate only to the rich, they're, they are actually an indispensable staff of daily life. However poor one is, and even solely from the point of view of personal interest, it is the worst of investments to substitute wealth for a portion of one's offspring. Why does family density have this effect upon suicide? In reply, one could not refer to the organic factor, for though absolute sterility has primarily physiological causes, insufficient fecundity has not, being usually voluntary and depending on a certain state of mind. Family density, moreover, measured as we have measured it, does not depend exclusively on the birth rate. We have seen that where there are few children, other elements may take their place, and vice versa, that their number may be of no significance if they do not actually and consistently share in the group life. Nor should this preservative virtue be ascribed to the special feelings of parents for their immediate descendants. Indeed, to be effective, these very feelings presuppose a certain state of domestic society. They cannot be powerful if the family has broken up. It is therefore because the functioning of the family varies with its greater or lesser density that the number of its component elements affects the suicidal tendency. That is... The density of a group cannot sink without its vitality diminishing. Where collective sentiments are strong, it is because the force with which they affect each individual conscience is echoed in all the others, and reciprocally. The intensity they attain therefore depends on the number of consciences which react to them in common. <clears throat> 
For the same reason, the larger a crowd, the more capable of violence the passions vented by it. Consequently, in a family of small numbers, common sentiments and memories cannot be very intense, for there are not enough consciences in which they can be represented and reinforced by sharing them. No such powerful traditions can be formed there as unite the members of a single group, even surviving it and attaching successive generations to one another. Small families are also inevitably short-lived, and without duration, no society can be stable. Not only are collective states weak in such a group, but they cannot be numerous, for their number depends on the active interchange of views and impressions, on the circulation of these views and impressions from one person to another. And on the other hand, this very exchange is more rapid the more persons there are participating in it. In a sufficiently dense society, this circulation is uninterrupted, for some social units are always in contact, whereas if there are few, their relations can only be intermittent, and there will be moments when the common life is suspended. Likewise, when the family is small, few relatives are ever together, so that domestic life languishes, and the home is occasionally deserted. But for a group to be said to have less common life than another means that it is less powerfully integrated. For the state of integration of a social aggregate can only reflect the intensity of the collective life circulating in it. It is more unified and more powerful the more active and constant is the intercourse among its members. Our previous conclusion may thus be completed to read. Just as the family is a powerful safeguard against suicide, so the more strongly it is constituted, the greater its protection. End quote. Okay, so at this point he's basically talking about the size of families, the size of households, uh, the birth rate, the, and the number of children, and the number of people living in one house together. And he basically says that a, a society cannot, uh, I mean, a, a family cannot be as strong uh, with as many uh, binding ties and with as many collective memories and collective impressions and ideas when it is small versus when it is large, because there just aren't as many interactions between people. There's not a constant, like if you have a house that has a constant flow of multiple people in it at all times, there are always ideas shared. There are always uh, bonds being formed in the house, in the household all the time. And a household with only, say, two people in it or one person in it isn't building the sort of social bonds uh, with the family because they're very often there's nobody home or one person is home but not the other person. Uh, and so there's sort of a continuum of how integrated the family is to one another, how how nuanced the relationships between all the members of the family are and how closely they feel bound into that family based on the size of the family. So he's he's drawing this conclude this connection between the size of the family, the integration of the family, the the presence of the person uh, feeling as though they are a part of a solid, strong social unit that serves as a sort of a uh, 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 disincentive to suicide, I suppose, uh, inoculation against suicidal uh, tendencies. And so that's so he talks first about religion. He talks about the family, and I'm not going to read the other parts about the family. Just that was the one that I wanted to read specifically. Um, and then he talks more about pol- the political society and how strongly integrated the political society is. I'm not going to read anything from that section. Um, there's it, there's a lot of data and a lot of uh, examples of this nation or that nation or or what have you. It didn't seem like quite fit to what I wanted to read. I would m- much rather get to the point where he starts drawing his conclusions from this section of the book. Uh, and this is the part that I want to read that's a little bit longer. Um, it's actually qu- fair, quite long. Well... Let's just say it's long. And he starts to pull it all together. So I'm going to read this section now. And then I'll talk a little bit more about this and about the rest of the book. So in this section, he says, quote, 
we have thus successively set up the three following propositions. Suicide varies inversely with the degree of integration of religious society. Suicide varies inversely with the degree of integration of domestic society. Suicide varies inversely with the degree of integration of political society. This grouping shows that whereas these different societies have a moderating influence upon suicide, this is due not to special characteristics of each, but to a characteristic common to all. Religion does not owe its efficacy to the special nature of religious sentiments, since domestic and political societies both produce the same effects when strongly integrated. This, moreover, we have already proved when studying directly the manner of action of different religions upon suicide. Inversely, it is not the specific nature of the domestic or political tie which can explain the immunity they confer, since religious society has the same advantage. The cause can only be found in a single quality possessed by all these social groups, though perhaps to varying degrees. The only quality satisfying this condition is that they are all strongly integrated social groups. So we reach the general conclusion. Suicide varies inversely with the degree of integration of the social groups of which the individual forms a part. But society cannot disintegrate without the individual simultaneously detaching himself from social life without his own goals becoming preponderant over those of the community. In a word, without his personality tending to surmount the collective personality. The more weakened the groups to which he belongs, the less he depends on them. The more he consequently depends only on himself, and recognizes no other rules of conduct than what are founded on his private interests. If we agree to call this state egoism, in which the individual ego asserts itself to excess in the face of the social ego and at its expense, we may call egoistic the special type of suicide springing from excessive individualism. But how can suicide have such an origin? First of all, it can be said that, as collective force is one of the obstacles best calculated to restrain suicide, its weakening involves a development of suicide. When society is strongly integrated, it holds individuals under its control, considers them at its service, and thus forbids them to dispose willfully of themselves. Accordingly, it opposes their evading their duties to it through death. But how could society impose its supremacy upon them when they refuse to accept this subordination as legitimate? It no longer then possesses the requisite authority to retain them in their duty, if they wish to desert, and conscious of its own weakness, it even recognizes their right to do freely what it can no longer prevent. So long as they are the admitted masters of their destinies, it is their privilege to end their lives. They, on their part, have no reason to endure life's sufferings patiently, for they cling to life more resolutely when belonging to a group they love, so as not to betray interests they put before their own. The bond that unites them with the common cause attaches them to life, and the lofty goal they envisage prevents their feeling personal troubles so deeply. There is, in short, in a cohesive and animated society, a constant interchange of ideas and feelings from all to each and each to all, something like a mutual moral support, which instead of throwing the individual on his own resources, leads him to share in the collective energy and supports his own when exhausted. But these reasons are purely secondary. Excessive individualism not only results in favoring the action of suicidogenic causes, but it is itself such a cause. It not only frees man's inclination to do away with himself from a protective obstacle, but creates this inclination out of whole cloth and thus gives birth to a special suicide which bears its mark. This must be clearly understood, for this is what constitutes the special character of the type of suicide just distinguished and justifies the name we have given it.
What is there, then, in individualism that explains this result? It has sometimes been said that because of his psychological constitution, man cannot live without attachment to some object which transcends and survives him, and that the reason for this necessity is a need we must have to not perish entirely. Life is said to be intolerable unless some reason for existing is involved, some purpose justifying life's trials. The individual alone is not a sufficient end for his activity, he is too little. He is not only hemmed in spatially, he is also strictly limited temporally. When, therefore, we have no other object than ourselves, we cannot avoid the thought that our efforts will finally end in nothingness, since we ourselves disappear. But annihilation terrifies us. Under these conditions, one would lose courage to live, that is, to act and struggle, since nothing will remain of our exertions. The state of egoism, in other words, is supposed to be contrary to human nature and consequently too uncertain to have chances of permanence. In this absolute formation, the proposition is vulnerable. If the thought of the end of our personality were really so hateful, we could consent to live only by blinding ourselves voluntarily as to life's value. For if we may, in a measure, avoid the prospect of annihilation, we cannot extirpate it. It is inevitable, whatever we do. We may push back the frontier for some generations, force our name to endure for some years or centuries longer than our body. A moment, too soon for most men, always comes when it will be nothing. For the groups we join in order to prolong our existence, by their means, are themselves mortal. They too must dissolve, carrying with them all our deposit of ourselves. There are few whose memories are closely bound to the very history of humanity to be assured of living until its death. For if we really thus thirsted after immortality, no such brief perspectives could ever appease us. Besides, what of us is it that lives, a word, a sound, an imperceptible trace, most often anonymous, therefore nothing comparable to the violence of our efforts or able to justify them to us? In actuality, though a child is naturally an egoist who feels not the slightest craving to survive himself, and the old man is very often a child in this and so many other respects, neither ceases to cling to life as much or more than the adult. Indeed, we have seen that suicide is very rare for the first fifteen years, and tends to decrease at the other extreme of life. Such, too, is the case with animals whose psychological constitution differs from that of men only in degree. It is therefore untrue that life is only possible by possessing its rationale outside of itself. Indeed, a whole range of functions concern only the individual. These are the ones indispensable for physical life. Since they are made for this purpose only, they are perfected by its attainment. In everything concerning them, therefore, man can act reasonably without thought of transcendental purposes. These functions serve by merely serving him. Insofar as he has no other needs, he is therefore self-sufficient, and can live happily with no other objective than living. This is not the case, however, with the civilized adult. He has many ideas, feelings, and practices unrelated to organic needs. The roles of art, Morality, religion, political faith, science itself are not to repair organic exhaustion, nor to provide sound functioning of the organs. All this supraphysical life is built and expanded not because of the demands of the cosmic environment, but because of the demands of the social environment. The influence of society is what has aroused in us the sentiments of sympathy and solidarity drawing us toward others. It is society which, fashioning us in its image, fills us with religious, political, and moral beliefs that control our actions. To play our social role, we have striven to extend our intelligence, and it is still society that has supplied us with tools for this development by transmitting to us its trust fund of knowledge. Through the very fact that these superior forms of human activity have a collective origin, they have a collective purpose. 
as they derive from society, they have reference to it. Rather, they are society itself, incarnated and individualized in each one of us. But for them to have a raison d'etre in our eyes, the purpose they envisage must not be one indifferent to us. We can cling to these forms of human activity only to the degree that we cling to society itself. Contrarywise, in the same measure as we feel detached from society, we become detached from that life whose source and aim is society. For what purpose do these rules of morality, these precepts of law, binding us to all sorts of sacrifices, these restrictive dogmas exist, if there is no being outside us whom they serve and in whom we participate? What is the purpose of science itself? If its only use is to increase our chances for survival, it does not deserve the trouble it entails. Instinct acquits itself better of this role. Animals prove this. Why substitute it for a more hesitant and uncertain reflection? What is the end of suffering above all, if the value of things can only be estimated by their relation to this positive evil for the individual, it is without reward and incomprehensible? This problem does not exist for the believer firm in his faith, or the man strongly bound by ties of domestic or political society. Instinctively and unreflectively they ascribe all that they are and do, the one to his church or his God, the living symbol of the church, the other to his family, the third to his country or party. Even in their sufferings they see only a means of glorifying the group to which they belong, and thus do homage to it. So the Christian ultimately desires and seeks suffering to testify more fully to his contempt for the flesh and more fully resemble his divine model. But the more the believer doubts, that is, the less he feels himself a real participant in the religious faith to which he belongs and from which he is freeing himself, the more the family and community become foreign to the individual, so much the more does he become a mystery to himself, unable to escape the exasperating and agonizing question, to what purpose? If, in other words, as has been often said, man is double, that is because social man superimposes himself upon physical man. Social man necessarily presupposes a society in which he expresses and serves. If this dissolves, if we no longer feel it in existence and action about and above us, whatever is social in us is deprived of all objective foundation. All that remains is an artificial combination of illusory images, a phantasmagoria vanishing at the least reflection, that is, nothing which can be a goal for our action. Yet this social man is the essence of civilized man. He is the masterpiece of existence. Thus, we are bereft of reasons for existence. For the only life to which we could cling no longer corresponds to anything actual. The only existence still based upon reality no longer meets our needs. Because we have been initiated into a higher existence, the one which satisfies an animal or a child can satisfy us no more, and the other itself fades and leaves us helpless. So there is nothing more for our efforts to lay hold of, and we feel them lose themselves in emptiness. In this sense, it is true to say that our activity needs an object transcending it. We do not need it to maintain ourselves in the illusion of an impossible immortality. It is implicit in our moral constitution and cannot be even partially lost without this losing its raison d'etre in the same degree. No proof is needed that in such a state of confusion the least cause of discouragement may easily give birth to desperate resolutions. If life is not worth the trouble of being lived, everything becomes a pretext to rid ourselves of it. But this is not all. This detachment occurs not only in single individuals. One of the constitutive elements of every national temperament consists of a certain way of estimating the value of existence, 
there is a collective as well as an individual humor inclining people to sadness or cheerfulness, making them see things in bright or somber lights. In fact, only society can pass a collective opinion on the value of human life. For this, the individual is incompetent. The latter knows nothing but himself and his own little horizon, thus his experience is too limited to serve as a basis for a general appraisal. He may indeed consider his own life to be aimless, he can say nothing applicable to others. On the contrary, without sophistry, society may generalize its own feeling as to itself, its state of health or lack of health. For individuals share too deeply in the life of society for it to be diseased without their suffering infection. What it suffers, they necessarily suffer. Because it is the whole, its ills are communicated to its parts. Hence it cannot disintegrate without awareness that the regular conditions of general existence are equally disturbed. Because society is the end on which our better selves depend, it cannot feel us escaping it without a simultaneous realization that our activity is purposeless. Since we are its handiwork, society cannot be conscious of its own decadence without the feeling that henceforth this work is of no value. Thence are formed currents of depression and disillusionment emanating from no particular individual but expressing society's state of disintegration. They reflect the relaxation of social bonds, a sort of collective asthenia or social malaise, just as individual sadness, when chronic, in its way reflects the poor organic state of the individual. Then, Metaphysical and religious systems spring up which, by reducing these obscure sentiments to formulae, attempt to prove to men the senselessness of life, and that it is self-deception to believe that it has purpose. Then, new moralities originate which, by elevating facts to ethics, commend suicide, or at least tend in that direction, by suggesting a minimal existence. On their appearance, they seem to have been created out of whole cloth by their makers, who are sometimes blamed for the pessimism of their doctrines. In reality, they are an effect rather than a cause. They merely symbolize, in abstract language and systematic form, the physiological distress of the body social. As these currents are collective, they have, by virtue of their origin, an authority, which they impose upon the individual and they drive him more vigorously on the way to which he is already inclined, by the state of moral distress directly aroused in him by the disintegration of society. Thus, at the very moment that, with excessive zeal, he frees himself from the social environment, he still submits to its influence. However individualized a man may be, there is always something collective remaining, the very depression and melancholy resulting from this same exaggerated individualism. He affects communion through sadness when he no longer has anything else with which to achieve it. End quote. Okay, so there are a couple of points in there that I want to draw attention to. First of all, he begins that section with, he puts forward a few postulates about how suicide varies inversely with the degree of integration of three different societies, religious society, domestic society, and political society. But he says that the real point here is what those things have in common, not the, not the facts of the religion, not the particular details of family or politics, but the thing they have in common is that they are integrated societies. And, uh, and he talks about how, how the individual, uh, seeks out something greater than himself and it's he says that it's often said that that men seek to make themselves to make their lives extend beyond uh their own short allotted amount of time in this world to make themselves in some way immortal by by adding uh you know whether it's by having children and cr and cr becoming the patriarch or the matriarch of a of a family by extending their themselves uh in that in that way or by making a mark politically or or in some way extending their own presence in the world beyond their lifespan but he points out that every institution will die 
every, you know, and, and, and the mark that one leaves becomes distilled down to a simple notion or a simple, uh, a simple sound or whatever it might be that he talks about that isn't even attached, couldn't, might not even be attached to someone's name. Um, and even in, in the most extraordinary circumstances, nothing will last forever throughout humanity. Um, and so it's not actually the drive for immortality of an individual, because that's still rooted in the individual, but that instead it's a, it's a natural drive to be a participant in a greater society. He says basically uh, that man is double. We, we, have, we have multiple components to us. And one of us is a social self and a physical self. He says, so, he says um, social man and physical man. And that, and that social man uh, has, has needs to be a part of a society. And that with the dissolution of social man, with, the, with an aimless social man, the, the physical man has no purpose or function. He basically is saying that we instinctively, uh, we instinctively bind ourselves into these groups and that we feel complete when we're a participant in these groups. Uh, I've heard it stated, and I'll, and I'll actually get to a book that talks about this in more detail, that Durkheim considered uh, humans to be homo duplex. That, in other words, that the dual nature of our being is so fundamental to us that we're we're partly individual and we're partly social. And he talks so he talks about well, I had said that he was talking about egoistic suicide. He also talks about altruistic suicide and anomic suicide. Altruistic suicide is essentially when a person gives their life for the community, uh, whether it's because of some sort of um, r- uh, religious or supernatural belief that if he kills himself, then uh, you know, it will help bring about prosperity for, uh, for the, for the greater tribe. Oftentimes, you know, that's related to some sort of relationship with the gods or some supernatural element. Um, or if he becomes old, that it's dishonorable to die, uh, old because one becomes a burden on their, on their society. And so as one becomes old and they have not yet died in battle, it's their duty to kill themselves. Or if they bring dishonor to their family, it's their duty to kill themselves. Or if a great chieftain dies, that it's the, it's the duty of his, uh, his lieutenants to kill themselves or his wives to kill themselves. So that's the altru- altruistic suicide. And that kind of ba- is based upon the social aspect of man completely obliterating the individualistic aspect of man. And then the egoistic suicide is the reverse. This is a this is a, a a function of individualistic man having broken completely free from social man and no longer having a function, uh, no longer having a a a purpose because they don't find their innate instinctive need to participate in gr- in a group uh, to be satisfied. It's essentially lo- a, a sort of loneliness, I guess. Um, because the, the, the integration of the various societies in which he belongs are not, you know, those, those societies and the integration of them are not strong enough for him to feel like he's securely bound in the society that he doesn't need to justify the society, explain the society rationally, why he needs to be in this society. It's instinctive to him to have that desire. So, uh, that's really interesting. The, the third one was the anomic su- suicide, and this is more, um, more based on social norms and knowing, knowing where one fits within a society. And he talks about, uh, rap- rapid changes of societies, whether it's economic changes or in the, in the face of, uh, of other sorts of political disruptions where social classes become confused and therefore people don't know exactly how they're supposed to behave to other people. They don't know exactly what their lifestyle should be like because they don't have a firm social class to which they belong. Um, now, I'm a fan of the term enemy. It basically means without norms, normlessness. Um, and it's a sort of uh, alienation or, or uh, detachment 
from society and a sort of aimlessness that one finds oneself when when he or she doesn't have a, a set of social norms to which he can instinctively um, uh, retreat. Now, we live in a society where, where, like, we don't really have social classes in the same manner. We have a meritocracy. You can move up and move down the social class based on your actions. And so there's not anywhere near the sort of uh, prescribed behaviors for uh, this person or that person based on social class. And I'm not really a fan of, like, predetermined, hard-set social classes. Um, I like the premise of the meritocracy and and our society is changing and has been changing and we're kind of in this state of perpetual flux as technology advances uh pr- well primarily as technology advances in the shape of our of our uh, society shifts along with it i don't know as though we're capable or whether it will be good to re-establish some sort of social uh you know social classes in a state of stasis uh Although there are some reasons that, you know, like the suicide rate, for example, why that that might be something that we should strive for. But uh, I think that the first concept there, the egoistic, I mean, we're not in a society where people are committing altruistic suicide so much as people are committing egoistic su- suicide. They're lost and they're aimless. And I think that the the lack of integrity of the different societies or the lack of integration, I should say, the, the strength of the bonds of the different societies in which people find themselves uh, is the primary factor of current suicides. And I think that there there is a sense of social norms uh, and and stable social norms that can sort of be tied in with that first egoistic suicide. So these integrated societies have their own social norms. They have their own codes of behavior um, that that's not based necessarily on this social class, but say what you know what your religious beliefs are, what your family norms are. Every family would have their own particular norms. Uh, but also, you know, these there is something to be said for these greater social norms that kind of define what a culture is. And as our culture is has become so multicultural, and the very notion of homogenous culture is sort of scoffed at, um, we do lose those sense of social norms, and we don't always know how to behave around one another and how to interact with one another because of those loss of norms. Uh, so that concept of anime is something that I wanted to introduce in this book and those other uh, premises about the, the forms of social disintegration. And then I do want to mention also when he talked about suicide being not just a, a, a an individual phenomenon but a, a social phenomenon, I think we see in some cases uh, a sort of a civilizational suicide or a civilizational suicide drive uh, in some of Western society. And I think that's something that's really interesting. We'll explore further uh, in other books. I'm about wound down to the end of the show, so I guess I'll wrap it up Wrap it up here. You can uh, check out my social media presence. Primarily, I'm on Twitter and Facebook. I do more on Twitter, uh, but that's that's where I'm at with that. You can reach out to me at natureinthenation at gmail.com or go to my website, Nature in the Nation. I'm on YouTube uh, as well. Search search for Nature, Nature in the Nation. I'm on the you know the main podcast uh, uh, avenues, iTunes, Google Play, uh, Spreaker, uh, Castbox. Search you'll probably find me on your uh, podcast aggregator of choice. And I guess that will wrap it up for now. So thanks for tuning in. Bye. <laughs>